30. Okay, uh, folks, um, I'd like to welcome us here to the meeting this afternoon and uh, thank him for the members for attending today's short notice. Uh, the meeting has been convened to receive a briefing from the Fish Fishermen's uh, Federation on the impact of the local fishing industry of leaving the EU, particularly in relation to issues around fishing quota. I advise members that the briefing today will replace uh, the evidence session originally planned for the 28th of January. Um, given that, uh, members should, uh, should members wish to raise any other issues they have regarding the EU exit and the fishing industry, such as the issue of local boats now only be able to land their catch at two uh, ports uh, in the south, this is your opportunity to do so today. Uh, Philip, Clare, uh, John, Morris and Patsy will be joining the meeting uh, via Starleaf. Uh, you are very welcome. And as usual, the um, committee will be broadcast through our parliament, parliament buildings and uh, online. Uh, you're welcome to use mobile devices so long as they're in airplane mode and are muted. Uh, with apologies from Patsy, Malone and Philip, um, I understand who was uh, involved with that debate that's on right now at the moment in the chamber. Um, so the next item on the agenda, we have a, a, we're, we're moving on to have an oral briefing from the Fishermen's Federation on the impact of EU exit in the fishing industry. I want to refer members to the following papers in the packs, the correspondence from the Federation, pages 4 to 5 and 6 to 7. Uh, uh, a briefing document from the Federation, 8 to 11, correspondence from this committee to the Minister Eustace at pages 12 to 14, and a further Federation briefing document at pages 15 to 16. Um, I should also note that in the event of, of a division uh, in the Chamber, the meeting will suspend to allow members who are casting their vote in person an opportunity to do so and to allow the lobby clerk to co count the votes. Uh, so at this juncture in the meeting, I'd like to welcome by Starleaf uh, from the Federation, Mr. Alan McCullough and, uh, and Mr. Harry Wick. Uh, I thank you for coming for the committee meeting at very short notice. Um, we consider this issue of quota apportionment urgent, considering the critical decisions to be made by the UK government, most likely by the end of this month. And what I want to ask you is if you take maybe around 10 minutes or so to outline to the committee the, the position of the Federation in this matter, and then the committee members will, have, uh, will, want, 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 will want to ask some questions. So, um, Alan or Harry, any of you want to kick off there first? So Mr. Magaliers, Alan here, and I'll start first and then Harry will continue. Uh, Chairman, can we first of all thank you, the committee members and the staff of the committee for arranging today's emergency meeting at what has been short notice. Uh, your approach, the committee's approach to this is uh, deeply appreciated. In May 2020, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Michael Gove MP, presented Command Paper 226 to Parliament, dealing with the UK's approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Paragraph 52 of that paper deals with fisheries. It includes the following sentence, and I quote, The fishing industry is of great importance to Northern Ireland, and we are determined to ensure that fishers from Northern Ireland are not placed at any disadvantage, either through customs duties or associated barriers. It is ironic today, Mr Chairman, that Northern Ireland's fishing industry's greatest fear from the Brexit deal is not customs or associated barriers, but rather that within the UK, London will seek to redistribute some of what should be Northern Ireland's share of the additional fishing quotas gained from the EU. Across the UK, existing fishing quotas are distributed on the basis of a system known as fixed quota allocation units. And FQAs are a dynamic tool that have allowed Northern Ireland fishermen to invest in fishing opportunities all around the UK. Today, Northern Ireland's fishermen hold about 8.4% of all UK fishing opportunities are FQAs. And there seems to be a presumption that Northern Ireland's fishing operations are confined to the RIC, a presumption that George Eustace, the EFRA Secretary of State, again implied in recent answers to parliamentary questions. They are not. Only 20% of Northern Ireland's FQAs are, quota, are comprised of fish and shellfish stocks in the, in the RIC. So in other words, 80% of our fishing opportunities are comprised of quota holdings to the west of Scotland, in the North Sea and in the Southwest approaches. We suspect DEFRA's aim is to allocate only a proportion of the UK's gains in the RIC to Northern Ireland's fishermen. When Northern Ireland's existing share is applied to the additional quota gained by the UK from the EU, it should mean that Northern Ireland gains new fishing opportunities in all sea areas worth £19 million per annum from 2026. 
50% of this is prawns, the most important local catch here in Northern Ireland. 30% is pelagic species such as mackerel and herring. 20% are demersal whitefish species. All local fishermen will benefit and the local industry has an open mind as to how this quota should be allocated and used within Northern Ireland. DEFRA consulted in October 2020 as to how any additional quota might be allocated across the UK. We have provided the committee with a copy of our response to this consultation. In short, all of the alternative propo proposals from DEFRA would penalise Northern Ireland's fishermen. We believe DEFRA are manoeuvring to reallocate quota from Northern Ireland to England, Scotland, to a lesser extent Wales, to placate fishing interests there who are bitterly disappointed with the outcome of the fisheries element in the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The Minister is aware of these issues and has been supportive, raising them in discussions with Ministers in London. And through our political representatives, we have also made the First and Deputy First Ministers aware of the matter. Our ask, Mr Chairman of the Committee today, is that you add your support and consider what representations you can make to DEFRA and Government Ministers to ensure that Northern Ireland is allocated its share of the additional UK quota based upon the hard work and investments made by Northern Ireland fishermen. Thank you. Okay. Harry, what, Harry, do you want to pick up on something there? Yeah, yeah, yes, please, Chair. Uh, if I may, uh, Alan has laid out uh, what the concern is. Uh, what I will do is uh, lay out why uh, why we feel the risk is uh, very credible. This is quite a complex uh, issue when you consider all the narrative that that, that surrounds it. But just for the to be absolutely clear, so there can be no confusion on the issue, what this is about for us is Northern Ireland getting its fair share of any additional quota that comes as a result of leaving the EU. It's not a, a, a conversation about what we will do with that quota uh, once we have it. There are certainly discussions uh, in Northern Ireland and other parts of the UK about how that quota could be applied within devolved administrations more fairly. We're, we're very, very open to those discussions, but what this is about for us is the allocation of quota between administrations, so between Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Wales. What happens when it gets to each of those administrations is down to that administration, but the decision on how much of it goes to each administration is a central government decision. Now, the reason we feel that the, there's a, a genuine threat here is, is borne out by some of the questions that were asked recently in the, the, the House of Commons. On the 14th, uh, Ian Paisley Jr. asked the Secretary of State for uh, the uh, DEFRA, he, he asked for, for, for no discrimination, I asked whether Northern Ireland would be given his, his fair share. The response from Mr. Useless was that the consultation is about uh, how, how this, this quota should uh, be allocated in a new fashion. The consultation isn't about whether it should be allocated in a new fashion, I uh, stress that point, but his response was whether it's about how it should be allocated in a new fashion. Now, that response suggests that in his mind, a decision has already been made uh, and the consultation is moot. His response indicates that it should be allocated in a, in a new fashion. And as Alan has pointed out, uh, any of the proposed new allocation methods within the consultation penalise Northern Ireland. Stephen Parry also asked him a question about uh, whether it would be allocated by uh, FQA and the Secretary of State avoided answering that section of, of, of Stephen's question. Uh, Carla Lockhart uh, illustrated to him directly that it would be disadvantageous, disadvantageous for Northern Irish vessels uh, to have quota allocated in any other method uh, than FQA's and I asked him if he could confirm that it would be allocated by, by FQS. Uh, his response was that he was working closely with devolved administrations to work towards a fairer sharing arrangement, implying that the arrangement that exists currently, uh, allocation by FQS, is in his view, not fair. Now, we have to be realistic about what we expect the Secretary of State to say uh, about an issue that's under consultation. But I think from, from the language he's used, uh, it's perfectly clear to me that, that in his mind, uh, he thinks that there has to be a change. 
what also concerns me is uh, the, the the response we get from his civil servants when we discuss uh, the issue. Uh, we have a very very positive working relationship uh, with with, with deaf or civil servants, and they're they're normally very very happy to tell us what their thoughts and plans are in specific areas. On this particular issue, however, uh, it, it is just the party line, uh, and certainly the indication I'm getting from, from my discussions with those civil servants is that th th there's a very strong chance that Northern Ireland is going to be disappointed uh, in this regard, uh, and disappointment equates to being disadvantaged. What, uh, I suppose the simplest way of, of expressing the situation is, if you visualise uh, two fishermen, one from Northern Ireland, uh, one from England, uh, both are fishing in the North Sea. Uh, both are fishing for the same species uh, in the North Sea. Both vessels fish alongside each other. At the end of this process, the English fishing vessel could receive a greater uplift of fishing opportunity than the Northern Irish fisherman, purely by the virtue of the fact that he is English. That is grossly unfair and, and in my view, politically tenable. Politically untenable. Uh, th thanks for the opportunity to, to address the committee. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Harry. Um, and just before I, uh, I move around here, um, the, they're supposed to, I've been looking through the documents here, and again, without prejudice what any other committee member would say, um, I, would, I would know that we'd want to do whatever we can with you to get the best for the fishermen and fisherwomen here as well, regardless of how we end up in, in the current position that we're in. Uh, but just to elaborate a little further there, you made reference and you explained in good detail about the, about the, quota, about the quota issue. Um, there also was issues in, in the documentation which I read through there relating to the, uh, the, the, the vessels, uh, the vessels from here being treated um, effectively like they're from a, a third country. There's also concerns raised about the £100 million modernisation fund that the British government's proposing, which, which wouldn't look at uh, the, the type of um, investment that's needed in the, the industry. There's a Home Office uh, skills issue as well, which, which has also been raised as well. Uh, so I just want to seek clarity from you. Um, in terms of, obviously, you know, I'm, sure, I'm sure, and I'm sure you'll get it. This committee will make representation robustly and support of the industry here. Would you, would, would you, would you be want? Could you update us on those other issues? And also, would you be wanting us to make representation across that those range of issues, or just specifically on the quota issue, Harry or Alan? I think if I come in first, there, Chair, um, it all starts at sea. As far as the fishing industry is concerned, it starts from fishermen leave the ports and count down and around Northern Ireland and go to go to sea to catch fish. Everything else streams from that. That's not underplaying the other issues and certainly Chairman, uh, we would we would really appreciate the committee support to come and look at the issues again of designated ports, which is actually a live issue today. The issue of the one hundred million pounds investment in the fleet, you're quite right in your assertion about that. The issue about crew is 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 is, is vital too. But I suppose the reason that we're attaching so, so much significance to the quota issue today is, as Harry said, we anticipate that a decision on this is going to be taken in London in the very near future, uh, possibly within, within the next two weeks. Uh, clearly, the fishing industry from across the UK are making different representations in respect to this. Uh, we're not asking for anything more, Chair, than our, than our fair share. Uh, like, and again, to repeat the numbers that I gave, 8.4%. Um, only 8.4% of the entire UK's quota has been caught, is owned in Northern Ireland. Uh, on the basis of that number, we've done our analysis of the, of the gains the UK has made from the EU. Uh, we have a fair idea, £19.1 million worth of quota that we should be getting every year, based on 8.4%. The thought chairman of either DEFRA or whoever coming in to raid Northern Ireland share of 8.4% so that they can placate fishermen from England or Scotland or Wales is to put it bluntly sickening. If, that, if that's the level that we've got to, um, having replaced one system, one EU system of discrimination on Northern Ireland fishermen, that we're now going to replace it with a GB system that applies more discrimination, clearly that's what we think of Northern Ireland. 
Okay. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Alan. And I'm just going to move around the room here. William has indicated he wants thank to speak. You, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation, and and how I, um, In relation to the 8.4 percent cuts at our allocation, from what I gather, there is a possibility of an increase in that. And are, are you concerned about losing some of your 8.4% or an increase that is likely to come that you should get your first share of? Which is the case, or is it both? Essentially, it is. Uh, th there's an extent of both. So the 8.4% the eight, eight, 8 uh, is what it is a percentage of the entire quota uh, that, that, that is held in Northern Ireland, the, the UK's entire quota that is held in, in Northern Ireland now. Uh, that the value of that 8.4% is due to increase uh, by virtue of the fact that we receive uh, extra fish as a result of leaving the European Union. What I suppose is at, at stake here is, is the amount that that 8.4% uh, will will increase uh, and why i suppose it's technically both is that if the remaining uh the remaining 91.6 percent get an increase uh, uh, and the 8.4 percent doesn't well then it does devalue that 8.4 percent uh, to an extent but the to, to set in the most simplest terms what we are what we're fighting for here is uh an increase in the value of that 8.4 percent not an increase in the 8.4 percent itself I, I understand. I, if there is an increase overall, you still want it to remain at eight point four percent. Isn't that right? If there's an overall increase, you would like uh, your uh, increase uh, to remain uh, if at, I, at least. If I, sorry, Mr. Herbin, um, if, if I can come in just to support Harry and what he has said, eight point four percent is the historic amount that Northern Ireland fishermen have of the UK's quota. We're not asking for anything more than that. We're just asking for that share to be applied to each of the species that the UK has gained from the European Union. So just as you analyse each one of the species, we have some we have a greater share, some we have a lesser share. But we just want our existing shares to be applied to the quota that the UK has gained from the EU. Nothing more. We're not asking to take some from England. We're not asking to take from any from Scotland or Wales. We just want our share. And as Harry has said, that when we get our share, we wish to sit down with all the stakeholders here in Northern Ireland and explore how that might be allocated and managed for the greater good of Northern Ireland. And that doesn't mean that we won't sit down with our colleagues across the UK, as we already do, and say, what can we do to help fishermen in other regions? But we need to secure Northern Ireland's share in the first instance. And we're not looking to take any away from England, Scotland or Wales. We just want our share based on what we hold today. Okay, okay I fully understand that now. Okay, yeah. I, I will move online here to Morris. Morris? Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation. Apologies, Chair. I had difficulty getting into the start, start of the meeting, uh, but it seems to be all right. Now. Uh, I would echo the, the, the remarks of the chairman. The remarks of the chairman that we, as a committee, we do and must do uh, everything we can to support the industry and ensure that Northern Ireland is fairly and with equality uh, compared to any other devolved administration. You cannot permit discrimination in any form, uh, not least against the fishing fleet. Uh, if, I, if I pick this up, Greg, eight point four percent is what uh, the Northern Ireland fleet already holds. They're not asking for any more. They're not wanting to accept any less. And having had that fair share of the 8.4%, the 8 then they in turn may divvy up uh, the quotas with other devolved administrations. For instance, if, uh, if there's a spare quota in Macro, that may be offered to Scottish fleet or, or the Welsh fleet or, or whatever. Is that, is that the way I'm picking this up? Yes, Mr. Bradley. Right. So, you know, and, and all, all you're asking for here today that is that we as a committee uh, throw our weight behind the minister and do everything we can to ensure that Northern Ireland fishermen are not disadvantaged in any way by whatever uh, they're trying to plan over from the next next year in the mainland. If that's what you're asking, I'm going to agree with that 100%. Okay, 
and I'm sure that the rest of the committee will do likewise. That's it in a nutshell, Mr. Bradley. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Morris. Um, Claire? Claire? Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, and thanks for both for, for um, raising this with us today as well. And just to be sure, so the 8.4% as is currently allocated um, is, in your opinion, the fair share that we should be getting? Yes. Okay. Yes. And yes. On, under the new UK Fisheries Bill, um, we were guaranteed equal access um, to all UK fishermen, including Northern Ireland, of course. Um, and that's now going to be compromised. This is the well, danger. Uh, this is the danger, Ms. Bandy. It's, it's coming back to the point that Harry made earlier. You're quite right. The UK Fisheries Bill guarantees equal access to all UK licensed fishermen, including those from Northern Ireland, to waters all around the UK. So it's a bit of an irony that we have a bill that guarantees access, but we have DEFRA considering now how they can make the thing unequal by awarding fish, more fish to fishermen in certain regions and taking it away from fishermen in our regions. So um, the Northern Ireland fishing sector were disproportionately impacted negatively from EU policy and we're now facing um, disproportionate impacts from UK government on internal policy. Despite a fisheries bill being passed guarantee equal access, they're now going to roll back on that already? That's our fear, yes. Okay, see the 80%, uh, I, um, I'm reading here, some of the 80% of the fishing opportunities for Northern Ireland held outside the REC. Um, where do they go? Will they be wholly in EU waters? Or is that in other international areas as well? It's in a mixture of waters, uh, Ms Bradley. Uh, those allocations are caught again in uh, the North Sea, they're, they're comprised of mackerel, they could be herring, and they're also, they're also prawns. Uh, some of it's landed outside of Northern Ireland. That's, uh, we need to get the proper infrastructure in Northern Ireland that we can bring more of this catch, catch home. Uh, but, but they're caught in all waters right around the UK. Okay, listen, can I ask you, um, I mean, I fully understand um, why, you know, it was in your favour to campaign for Brexit to leave the EU because you were so disproportionately, this whole sector was disproportionately impacted from there. Can I ask you in the background then, was there discussions um, from 2016 until now with the UK government in order to make sure that they understood the context of the sector here and were there any clear guarantees given to yourselves as the heads of your organisations or from DEFRA officials that, um, that any of this would take place or that you would be looked after properly? In terms of consultation with DEFRA officials, DEFRA officials, especially over the last two to three years, have been regular visitors to Northern Ireland and have uh, consulted with both Harry and, and I. In terms of the issue about how quota, this additional quota might be apportioned within the UK, yes, there was discussion. And it certainly was my understanding that the issue had been settled until the consultation paper that we prepared to appeared in October of last year. That came as a surprise to both, to both Harry and I. We understood that the 8.4% would be the basis for additional quota would be given to Northern Ireland. That was our clear understanding. And then that was all upset uh, with the DEFRA consultation paper last autumn. Thank you. So the UK government are rolling back on clearly given um, reassurances. Um, my concern on top of this as well is that um, given that the fisheries bill, the UK um, fisheries bill. We had no time for scrutinising that um, as a committee, uh, and that was clearly stated at the time. And I know that we are not working towards our own fisheries bill here in Northern Ireland as well. So, just as a final question to you, would there be any type of benefit that you can see in the long term? I know it's not an immediate solution, but in the long term of having our own fisheries bill, I think there would. Uh, very definitely, there. Northern Ireland is very good at sorting out Northern Ireland's own issues uh, when, it, when it comes to fishing, certainly in comparison to uh, what we see with uh, the, uh, England and uh, Scotland. So to be able to have the ability to do that uh, is trying to law uh, and give us the protections we need from 
uh, other circumstances which could be potentially damaging that come from out with Northern Ireland. Uh, I think that's something that Alan and, I, Alan and I would welcome very much. Just for the record, and I think you've been left in a shocking position, um, and you rightly, you know, are raising your concerns here at the twelfth hour. Um, you know, having no moves to enshrine in law a fisheries bill, and now having the rollback from UK government um, after everything that you've been through already is absolutely appalling. Um, so, thank you for being here today. Okay, Claire. Um, John, John Blair. Thank you, sir. I thank uh, Alan and Harry both for being here today to present to us and also keeping us updated on what's going on uh, in recent times as well. I think most of what I was going to raise, um, you'll understand, sir, has already been covered by my other speakers. Um, but I, ju I just want to reiterate the, the support expressed um, by other members for uh, the, the association represented. Look, as a committee, we, we are well aware of the potential to decimate our uh, coastal areas where fishing is a major economic hub, and, and, and we know that. But the question I was going to ask, but I think it's been answered, is um, you, you have been dealing with this since October, the consultation time, and prior to that, I assume. Um, you wrote to us on the 13th of January to the committee. You've dealt with the committee since then on setting up the meeting and, and giving us your information. I, um, I take it in summary, nothing has changed in recent days to offer you any reassurance on the, the matter is still for clarification between DEFRA, Secretary of State and our own dear Minister. Uh, that would be right, Mr Blair. Um, again, Harry earlier referred to the series of questions from Northern Ireland MPs to the DEFRA yeah, Secretary yeah. of State last week. Uh, they were all very good questions. Unfortunately, the answers were empty. Uh, my understanding is that yesterday afternoon, uh, Minister Foots had a meeting with his opposite member in London, uh, Minister Victoria Prentice. This issue again was raised on uh, two occasions. And uh, again, unfortunately, uh, Mrs Prentice was unable to give any guarantees, commitments or, or anything else. So all that does is just continue to raise suspicions uh, that somebody in London is trying to cook the books and steal quota off Northern Ireland fishermen. Uh, if I can add uh, to that, uh, Mr. Blair, in uh, very, very recent, uh, I think today, the largest fishermen's organisation in England, the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations, has come out uh, in support of a system that uses uh, any extra quota from Brexit uh, to benefit uh, their own members in select parts of England. So we could potentially see Northern Ireland's quota uh, being exchanged. Uh, with international partners to benefit those in the in the southwest of England and in the in the North Sea. So the fact that our sister organisations on the other side of the water are campaigning for Northern Irish quota, uh, potentially Northern Irish quota to be taken and then exchanged, is an issue of grave and immediate concern. Yeah, are, are you satisfied, both of you, that the the matter I referred to there about how um, proportionately? Um, fisheries uh, relates to the economy in some of our coastal towns. Are you satisfied that that's being represented by Northern Ireland uh, and our structures here in negotiations with DEFRA? Thinking of obviously oh. like Kilkeel and Port of Bogey, where, where f f fisheries are a, a major part of the local economy and much more than that, socially as well. I think our, our priority, Mr. Blair, was, was clearly seeing once what sort of a deal came out between the UK and the EU. And like, like fishermen across the UK, overall, we are disappointed by the deal. Yeah. Um, I thought long and hard as to why I'm disappointed. And to be honest, the reason I'm disappointed is because expectations were raised so high by the Prime Minister and all those below him. And clearly, when it came to the 24th of December, they couldn't meet those expectations. So we're disappointed at that level. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we have to recognise that if what we're asking for today is delivered, if Northern Ireland gets its fair share of the additional quota, that means by 2026, based on 2020 values, uh, we will get an additional 19.1 million pounds per year. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's big to coastal communities in Northern Ireland, Mr. Blair. In terms of UK fisheries, it is small. It's small, yeah. It's yeah. tiny. It's yeah, Alan, that's why Alan and I use the word proportionately, and, and it boils yes. down, I suppose, 
uh, in a nutshell. Our economic need is as great and as real as anyone else's in this regard. Absolutely. The, the, you, look, you've got it. The economic need of Northern Ireland PLC, the economic need of the fishing communities right around the coast of Northern Ireland is not the same of the economic need in the south of England. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. okay. Um, we're going to move around to uh, the other Harry in the room here. Yep. Hi, Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think, well, briefly, we need to secure Northern Ireland's share of the the additional fishing opportunities. Um, Northern Ireland can't be diminished at all. Whatever it needs to be better, a long way better than Hague. Um, I think if we have the quota, we can. We, I know we need to be able to catch them and market it, but we can do that. We need to improve infrastructure, but we will. We need to enlarge our fleets, many more fishermen and men and women on land. Um, we know that. Um, I think the fact that we can, we will be able to sell them tariff free. At least we know we have a market, so we need to be able to get them. But I would be fighting for even more than the 8.4. Well, the 8.4 is good and keeps us the same. I mean, we were led to believe, by the UKG, that we would be better off. Um, and now we're, we're really wondering, I mean, we really need to make sure we are better off, and we will do and play our part here. Know that if you can. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harvey. As Alan has pointed out, we have the potential in our coastal communities to be 19.1 million pounds uh, better off. Uh, your assistance in, in securing that and stopping other interests from the UK from from slashing that figure is greatly appreciated. Okay. Uh, um, can I just add to to Harry's comments, Mr. Harvey? Look, the, the whole world, Northern Ireland included. Hopefully this year we'll start to recover from this global pandemic that we've all been suffering. The fishing industry is not coming to the committee today asking for a handout. All we're asking for is that we share our share of this new quota so that we can contribute in our way to Northern Ireland's economy to rebuild the economy. Nothing more. Nothing more. We want to help you do that. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Rosemary. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you, Alan and Harry, for your comments here today. It's been interesting listening to you coming from the lakes of Fermanagh. Um, just um, certainly, I would, I would welcome the comments made by the chair and by the other members around the table in trying to support you to get your, what you're entitled to, your fair share. Most of the questions have already been asked that I was thinking of. But one question I want to ask, and... Maybe I'm asking you to look through a crystal ball, but you're concerned if you do if you do lose, do have a smaller share or are given a smaller share of this 19 million. How how much are you? How much? What are your thoughts on how much it could be cut? Be, are you talking be, about fifty percent? Are you talking about maybe one million less? That's. We also don't know, uh, Mrs. Barton. We don't know, and and, and, and it's a good question. Uh, this is the unknown territory that we're working in. Like you think of it this way: the fishing year has started. A fishing year runs from the first of January through to the thirty-first of December. We have boats at sea, weather permitting. As we sit here today, we actually don't know what fishing opportunities we're going to have uh, for, 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 the, for, the, for the rest of this year. But I, we, could, we could speculate, and you've used the term crystal ball. Uh, I've, my crystal ball hasn't been working too well for the last, the last 29 years in this, in, in, in this job. Um, but we could speculate as to what we might lose, what would be the minimum, what would be the maximum. Um, forgive me, but I don't want to get into that field. I'll say it again, and as Mr. Harvey said, the 8.4%, but ideally we could look for more. But we're not greedy people. We're not greedy people. All we're asking George Eustace for is a share based on historic catches and the investment that Northern Ireland fishermen have made um, over, the, over, over the past few years. Nothing more and nothing less. Okay, thanks. Okay, Miss Billy, you're looking back in again? Thanks, you sound delighted. <laughs> uh, listen, I just want to come back to the fisheries bill. Um, again, if I can, please. Um, 
because I know that for myself, I'm a wee bit unsure because of the lack of scrutiny time around it. Now, you're mentioning here that it guarantees equal access to all UK fishermen. Now, are we in a situation where access is going to be couched as in not quotas? Is there anything in the fishing bill that sets out any guarantee of quotas or access to your getting on with your business? Or is it simply just access? I'm thinking about, you know, are we going to look at access as in you'll be able to freely sail about them, but just can't catch in them? The issue of, of access in the context of the fisheries bill is along the lines that, that no administration can exclude vessels from another administration uh, from fishing in their, their waters. Uh, no, but the, 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 principle, the principle runs much deeper. Uh, we, we certainly see some administrations in the UK maybe trying to work around that in, in discriminative ways. So for example, uh, we see the administration in the Isle of Man making it technically more difficult for non-Isle of Man vessels to fish in their waters. That's one form, I think, of breaching the principle of equal access. Uh, the issue of giving one fisher in one area uh, an uplifting quota based on their nationality, where, where, whereas another doesn't, uh, is another form of uh, discrimination of, of equal access. I think it's unfortunate that the fisheries bill determines equal access in such a simplistic way uh, by non-discrimination between devolved authorities uh, based on access to waters, when actually the principle uh, uh, and the moral segment of equal access goes much further, uh, but the fisheries bill doesn't stretch quite that far. Okay, so is there any, um, any concern then that if your quota is restricted or taken away or reduced even further, is that contravening the fisheries bill? Well, the argument everyone would make, uh, the argument the UK government was make, is we're, we're not taking anything away because it hasn't been given to you yet. Uh, what we have is a reasonable expectation of, of getting the additional quota and the risk that the, the UK government is going to take that reasonable expectation away and give it to someone uh, give it to someone else. Yeah. Thank you. If, 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 I, if I could put on this really in, uh, in, in, in another way, it's like, it's like, let's take the example of our backyard in the RIC. What effectively the UK fisheries bill is saying is that a fisherman from Northern Ireland will have equal access to the RIC along with a fisherman in England. They will both have the same access. But what's been considered in London today is that whilst they both have the same access, then the fisherman from England will be given more quota than the fisherman from Northern Ireland. In other words, we'll increase his fishing opportunities um, at the expense of those in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Hey, Claire. Thanks. Um, Harry, Harry Long, just before, um, uh, um, before William was talking back in here again, see the 8.4%, the how long has that their quota been in place? You know, how is it calculated to begin with? Chairman, the, the, the fixed quota allocation units, and to give the, the fishing industry acronyms here, the FQA units, uh, were established in the late 1990s. And they were basically reflecting uh, historic fishing patterns or a reference period uh, through the middle of the 1990s. So that basic FQA, the core FQAs were established back in the 1990s. But what ha has happened since then is that fishermen throughout the UK have created in quota. They have bought FQAs, they've sold FQAs, as fishing patterns have, 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 have changed and evolved. And every few years there has been um, the opportunity to update the, what we call the FQA register to reflect uh, that, that trade. So, so my argument would be, uh, be yes, that in the absence of, a, of, a, of a, an updated register in the last year or two, actually the FQA register pretty much reflects fishing activity uh, right up to recent, recent years. It shouldn't be seen in a historic context. Thanks for that, Alan. William? Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you very much. And certainly, I think you've heard this committee, and I haven't heard a member that is only but behind you in this situation. What, in essence, you are saying that if Northern Ireland gets its fair share of any increased quota, that will be a plus for Northern Ireland and it will mean that Northern Ireland is treated fairly. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yes. Um, look, Harry and I, Mr. Irvine, we, we get it. Look, we've, we've been with the committee before. Um, over the last four, four and a half years in the lead up to uh, Brexit, probably the fishing industry in Northern Ireland was a rather unique in a, in a unique position um, in that it was one of the few industries that supported Brexit. Uh, we could see the opportunities that come that, that will continue to come from it. And 
let's be clear about that. Uh, we will win. What we're asking today is that we want to win our, our fair share, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and we want to contribute to the economy of Northern Ireland. Um, people have said to me and said to Harry, well, but sure, fishing is only a tiny part of the economy. And they're quite right, Mr. Irvine. It is a tiny part of the economy. And one reason it has been a tiny part of the economy is that for over 40 years it was beaten down by the EU system. And I take my hat off every day to the fisher people out through the door of the office that I'm sitting in that have endured uh, years and years of pressure and so much from the European Union that they have survived today. And having got through the 2021, there's an offering on the table that will help to rebuild this industry, that will contribute to the economy of Northern Ireland. And all we're asking for Mr. Irwin is to be given the chance to contribute to, to Northern Ireland. Nothing, nothing more. Um, at, at the beginning of this committee hearing today, uh, like the chair did mention the other issues like design, the designated ports that's been in the media um, over the past uh, week and a half. That, that is a live issue today. And that's where the, the, the protocol, the Ireland Northern Ireland protocol kicks in and like as, as we're sitting here today, it is a moving goalpost. And, and unfortunately, um, and I do mean that sincerely, whilst yesterday it was a good news day, uh, we welcomed a step in the right direction from the Irish authorities that they were going to designate more ports to help fishermen in Northern Ireland. Uh, we feel today, having, having made one step forward yesterday, we always feel today that we're taking two, two steps back. And uh, some of the regulations that are um, within the protocol are simply daft when it comes to the fishing industry. But we're, we've been told by the Irish authorities, for example, that a fisher boat from the Taylor, Dance, Port of Logie, or Derry, or wherever it comes from in Northern Ireland, can, can land into a small number of ports certain days of the week, at certain times, depending on their size, and even then they have to comply with international regulation. Yet, the same fishing boat can take their product into the Taylor, can take it to Lisnahalli, put it on the back of a lorry, and according to the Northern Ireland Protocol, can drive it back and forward all day long over the border unfettered. What we're saying, Mr Chairman, is that going forward, there's a lot of work still to be done. The fishing industry will benefit. We will, we will recover. But there's so much that needs to be fine-tuned here. Kate okay, Rosemary? Yeah. Just uh, to go back... Um, you wrote to uh, the chairman there on the 13th of January, and you referred to uh, you referred to your we should benefit from the additional 19 million. Now, we should benefit. You've never actually heard that from government or from any official source that it will be approximately 19 million. You're quite quite right, Mr. Barton, to, to pick up. Uh, we we carefully use the word should. Uh, when we do the analysis of the additional quota that the UK got from the EU, we apply the 8.4%. The figure 19.1 million is what we should get. Our fear that we're expressing today is that we won't get it because it will be raided, it will be stripped, it will be stolen uh, by, by DEFRA. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right. Okay, thank you, Chair. I mean, I think the first thing we need to find out is... What they're hiding from us, we need to be hitting them from all roads and directions and get in that door before they come out with the result. Because at the minute, if they're hiding it from us, I mean, we're still actually able to change it. So I certainly would do all my power and speak to whatever RMPs and lobbying and doing whatever. I think we all need to be shouting from the rooftops and saying anything less, factor want more, is not acceptable and get on with it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Um, um, Harry and Alan, is there anything you want to add before we, before we adjour adjourn here? Uh, I may, uh, we could just touch on the subject of the uh, 100 million pounds that was uh, promised to the industry by the uh, Prime Minister. In the, in the speech where he announced uh, this amount of money, he said it was specifically for modernisation. Now, if we look at uh, the fishing vessels uh, in, in Northern Ireland, uh, you don't have to look very hard in, in any of our harbours to find vessels that are maybe uh, 50 years old. There is no part of the UK uh, that the Clyde may come into the conversation, but there's no other part, certainly other part of the UK, where there's a greater need for, for modernisation uh, than in the Northern Irish fishing fleet. 
Now, to put £100 million into perspective, uh, that is enough to replace the oldest 2% of, of over, over 10 metre trawlers in the UK. So there is not an awful lot of money uh, to go around throughout the whole of the industry in the UK and the, the fish processing sector as well. And that's why it's vitally important that Northern Ireland fights for this money on, on the basis of need rather than on the basis of the uh, Barnard formula or any other basis. We would see the, the richer parts of the industry in the UK try and, try and hoover up this money for themselves. So your support and representing Northern Ireland's cause for a fair share of this uh, additional £100 million allocated according to need and not greed would be very welcome also. Thank you for that, Harry and, and Alan. And can I seek an agreement from the committee here that we would write a letter of support uh, for the fishing industry based on the conversations we had today? And we do that as a matter of uh, pr top priority? Yep, on the first yep. Okay, agreed? Yep. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Alan and Harry, for coming here at short notice. And certainly you've heard us given the unanimous agreement of the committee here to uh, make that representation. So thank you very much, and we'll probably be seeing you again at some stage in the future. Okay. We, we look forward to it, Chair, but just a, a cl closing word the way that it started. We, we appreciate your support. We appreciate all the committee members and indeed the staff approach because we did approach you at very short notice last week and you pulled this together today and it is very much appreciated and it's recognised. Thank you. Yeah, we recognise your initiative as well. So thank you, Alan and Harry. And, uh, um, thank you. Alan and Harry. So thank you very much. Now. Take care now. I know. So, um, didn't have next meeting next Thursday at 10 a.m. room 30. So, we'll adjourn. Okay.